Now, this morning I preached a sermon about science fiction religion, and we talked a lot about how a lot of the atheists of this world, especially the really evangelical atheists, the ones who really push and promote atheism in the media and through their books and through media appearances, etc., how basically they're not really following science because they like to hide behind science and say, well, we as atheists, we're just really logical, rational people. We're just going where the evidence leads us. And, you know, the evidence is showing us that there's no God and it's all based on science. It's all based on fact. But we showed this morning how it's not science. It's science fiction. It's what these guys are really into. They start out by hating the Lord, start out by rejecting the God of the Bible, and then setting out with that agenda mixed in with a whole lot of steady diet of science fiction, they come up with all this crazy nonsense. And we looked at that all this morning. But I had a lot of stuff this morning that I didn't get to, and so I wanted to continue the sermon tonight. But really, I, I kind of just want to focus on one thing tonight that was in my sermon this morning, but it kind of needs its own sermon, and I was out of time. And the title of the sermon tonight, you know, you could call it Sci-Fi Religion Part 2, or you could call it Star Wars in Light of the Bible, would be another title for the sermon. Okay, now, here's the reason I bring this up. It's not just the atheists who are heavily influenced by science fiction. It's not just the atheists. In fact, a lot of Christians and a lot of just Americans in general have become heavily influenced by science fiction to the point where they have ideas and beliefs that are not biblically based. And in fact, they contradict the Bible but they're coming from science fiction. Where science fiction and other things that they see on TV and are taught in the media in general overrides what the Bible says. It supersedes what the Bible says. Now, this shouldn't really surprise us when you think about the fact that your average American and your average Christian spends more time watching TV, watching movies, in the media in general, than they spend in the Word. I mean, would anybody really argue with that statement? I mean, would you really tell me that people today amongst your independent Baptist churches, your evangelical Christian churches, are, you think most people in America today are spending more time in the Bible or more time watching TV or watching movies or other uh, media outlets? You know it's true. Therefore, we cannot help but speak the things that we've seen and heard, the Bible says. And so there's this constant influx of wrong philosophy and then just a little trickle of the Bible that gets in when we're gracious enough to give God a minute or two of our time for a little Bible devotion. And then you wonder why people's ideas are so different than what the Bible teaches. And then you wonder why you get up and preach hard from the Bible and people just think you're nuts and they're so shocked. It's because they've got their mind on a whole nother program. Okay. And obviously, Star Wars is just a small part of that. Yeah. Okay. But I want to focus on this tonight because of the fact that this is a really popular movie, obviously. It's, it's huge. I mean, I remember I saw my first Star Wars movie when I was probably five or six years old. I remember I was just a little tiny kid, and I was Return of the Jedi, and I was watching in my living room, and I fell asleep toward the end. But I swore to my parents I was just resting my eyes. You know, it's one of those, you know, kids never want to admit that they fell asleep during a movie. So I was just resting my eyes. But anyway, you know, this is a really popular film. And also, because of the fact that it's a, a rated PG, family-friendly type of a film, this is something that Christians really rally around. And, and they say, well, you know, we love Star Wars. Well... I want to point out a major philosophy that's taught in Star Wars that seems to have permeated our culture and permeated Christianity. And it's not coming from the Bible. It's actually coming from Buddhism and other false religion. But one of the major themes of Star Wars is this idea of the Force and that there's the dark side of the Force. You know, beware of the dark side. You know, so I went on to a website that had the transcript of all the movies, where it's just the text. You know, so I don't have to sit and watch the movie. So here's all the text, and I just searched the word dark side, and I found some of the quotes about this that I remembered. Listen to this. This is going to be from Yoda, okay? <laughs> and I'm not going to do the Yoda voice, because I know... Everybody wants it. Yeah, I don't know. 
I do a lot of impressions, all right, people, but I don't, I can't do this one, I'm sorry. But he said, you know, Yoda says, a Jedi's strength flows from the Force, but beware of the dark side. Anger, fear, aggression, the dark side of the Force are they. So, you know, according to Star Wars, oh man, just stay away from anger. Stay away from fear. What? Well, that's a ticket to the dark side, okay? Uh, then, you know, Obi-Wan Kenobi came out. He said, Luke, don't, don't give in to the hate, Luke. That leads to the dark side, all right? And then, you know, the Emperor. Here, this is from Return of the Jedi. You know, the Emperor, when he's dealing with Luke Skywalker, he says, you know, good, I can feel your anger. Take your weapon, strike me down with all your hatred. And your journey toward the dark side will be complete. So, according to Star Wars, basically, if Luke Skywalker, you know, kills the evil emperor who's, like, blowing up whole planets or whatever and just <laughs> yeah. killing billions of people, then he's giving in to the dark side. Because any anger, any fear, any hate, oh, that's the dark side. And honestly, you know, there's the other quotes that are kind of just the same thing. Fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. Okay. But here's the thing. This is not what the Bible teaches at all. But yet, this is what most Christians believe. Right. Most Christians that you talk to would tell you, all hatred is wrong. Yeah. Don't preach hate. Hate's not a family value. And oh, we should never hate. It should be all love. You know that what I'm telling you is the truth right now. They also have this idea that all anger is sinful. We should never be angry. We should never have fear. We should never have these different emotions that are perfectly natural, normal emotions that are part of our lives. And there is a godly hatred. There is a godly fear. And, of course, there's a, a righteous anger, a righteous indignation. But in America today, we're taught that we should never have these negative emotions. It should be positive only. The Joel Osteens of the world promote this positive only gospel. And over and over again, we're told that we should never experience uh, negative feelings. I mean, to the point where literally I talked to someone whose child died and a few weeks went by and their doctor was trying to put them on antidepressants. Oh, you're still upset? You're still depressed about your child dying? Your only child? Here, take these pills. Because we should never feel any negative emotions. Let's see what the Bible says on these particular subjects. Turn, if you would, to Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 3. And let me just point out to you, this is Buddhist teaching. In Buddhism, and if you listen to my sermon, Buddhism in light of the Bible, they have this idea where everything that's positive is good and everything that's negative is bad. This whole dark side type philosophy. And even when the Hindus are meditating and when they go to the yoga class, you know, they're breathing in everything that's positive and breathing out all the negative. But you know what? The Bible teaches that there's a time for the negative and a time for the positive. Just as our battery in our car needs to have a positive and a negative terminal in order to operate, so is life. And God, in the Bible, has positive portions of Scripture and negative portions of Scripture. And in fact, there's more negative in the Bible than positive. Honestly, if you look up, for example, when the children of Israel are going into the Promised Land and they're going to give the blessings and the cursings upon Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim, there are more than double the curses as there are the blessings. There are way more negative commandments than there are positive commandments. And in fact, if you look at the longest book of the Bible, it's pretty much the book of Jeremiah. A lot of people say Psalms, but if you look at how many words are in the book, it's right there neck and neck with Jeremiah. And in fact, by some measures, Jeremiah is just a hair longer. Jeremiah is a very long book, even though it's only 52 chapters. Chapters and verses are long. And that's probably the most negative book in the Bible. If you read the book of Jeremiah, it's very negative. Why? God is a God of love, but he's also a God of wrath. He's a God of vengeance. He said, vengeance belongeth unto me, saith the Lord. I'll repay. And people today, they just want to keep saying over and over again how God is love. But that's true. 
But also, what about holy is the Lord? What about God is angry with the wicked every day? So is God on a path to the dark side? Nope. <laughs> now, look what the Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. Look at verse 8. A time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. There's a time and a place for love and there's a time and a place for hatred. I mean, the Bible said in Psalm 139, and you, don't have to, you can turn to Amos 5.15, and I'm not going to spend all night on this point, although I could because there's so much scripture on this. The scripture that we read in Psalm 139 said, Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee. And am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee. I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. That's what David said in the book of Psalms. And that's not just his word. That's the word of God. Yeah. That's the inspired word of God from the mouth of the prophet David. The Holy Ghost speaking through him according to Jesus Christ yeah. in the book of Psalms. And he says, I hate them with perfect hatred. Perfect means complete. He's saying I have complete hatred for them. Yeah. Nothing but hatred is what he means by that. He says, those that hate the Lord, I hate them. But according to this new Christian mentality, then that would be hate speech. And that would be actually the dark side. And that would be unchristian and unloving and unchristlike. But wait a minute. This is the Holy Spirit talking. And even the man David was the man after God's own heart. And so this idea of hatred always being wrong or bad or we should never feel hatred is a false doctrine. Now, the Bible does condemn hating your brother without a cause. Yeah. You know, obviously, the Bible does teach love, and he says to love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. But here's the difference with that. The Bible says love your enemies. But he explains what he means by that. Those who do you wrong, love them. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. But what about when the Bible says, do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? Right. So the Bible's not saying we should hate those who hate us. He doesn't say, hey, if somebody hates you, hate them back. That's not what the Bible teaches. Right. No, the Bible says we're supposed to love those who hate us. We're supposed to do good unto those that persecute us. But when someone is a hater of the Lord, that's a person that we should hate. And there's a difference between hating our personal enemy and hating the Lord's enemy. You know, there have been a lot of people over the years that have been personal enemies of mine in the sense that they've done me wrong. They've been enemies at the job or enemies in other situations like school, for example. And I've had people lie about me and, and curse me and, and, and persecute me in school, at work, just in every area of life. And God commands us to turn the other cheek. God commands us to love them pray for them, and hopefully eventually they can get saved. And honestly, there have been people in my life that have gotten saved, and they were an enemy, and then they became a friend. Now, that's not always the way it's going to work. Obviously, some people are never going to come over to your side. But often you can turn your enemies into friends by loving them, by praying for them. And often it's not that they're bad people. It's just that they're misguided. And, you know, if we would show them the love of Christ, we could be a blessing and turn them around and be a good testimony. But then people will try to take that teaching of Scripture, which is a beautiful teaching in Scripture about loving our enemies, and they'll try to twist that to love pedophiles, love serial rapists, love Mao Zedong, Love Joseph Stalin. Love mass murderers. And they'll try to twist that doctrine to love everybody. It's not love everybody. It's bless those that curse you. Love your enemies and so forth. But there's a scriptural teaching here that says, Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee. You say, well, that's not a command. Yeah, but in 2 Chronicles 19, 2, there's a king who's rebuked by the prophet of God. And he says to him, Shouldest thou help the ungodly? And love them that hate the Lord, therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. So he actually rebukes him for loving those who hate the Lord in 2 Chronicles 19 too. So this teaching is consistent in multiple places in the Bible. It's not like it's just one verse that we're misunderstanding or something. No, there are multiple verses. We could turn to a lot of scriptures about hate. 
Uh, you're in Amos 5.15. This is a good verse. It says, hate the evil and love the good and establish judgment in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant of Joseph. Psalm 97.10 says, Ye that love the Lord hate evil. He preserveth the souls of his saints. He delivereth them out of the hand of the wicked. So there is a place for hatred in our life. You know, we should hate those that hate the Lord. And we should also just hate evil in general. David said, I hate every false way in Psalm 119. We should hate false doctrine. We should hate sin. We should hate perversion. Okay, these are the things that destroy people's lives. How could you sit here and tell me that God wants us to love a child molester? I mean, think about how wicked of a person a child molester is. How they take that sweet, innocent child and defile it and corrupt it and ruin their life. I mean, who thinks that child molesters should be taken out and killed Amen. as the punishment? Amen. I do. Man, too bad we're not some kind of a governing body here. Because right now it's a revolving door where they arrest these horrible, filthy perverts and they'll be put away for a few years and it's a revolving door. No, they ought to be taken out like a dog and shot. Amen. That's the biblical teaching of what should happen to these people. If we study God's law. And yet Christians today have been duped into this thing. And by the way, homosexuals or pedophiles, wake up. Yeah. Wake up, people. It's not like they show you on TV. They're not reproducers. They're recruiters. Right. And they're after your children. That's a whole other sermon of itself. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 28. Proverbs chapter 28. According to Star Wars... According to the media, according to science fiction, according to that which people are spending hours and hours and hours watching and very little time in this book. And then they say, oh, Pastor Anderson, you don't know what you're... Man, we shouldn't be hateful. We should never hate people. Hate is the dark side. It's like, that's Yoda talk. That's not the Bible talk. I'm serious tonight. They go, oh, it's a silly sermon, silly subject. You know what's silly? Is that Christians get their doctrine from this. And I know it's not just Star Wars, but Star Wars is just another brick in the wall of this continual brainwashing that's been taking place for decades now of just love everybody, accept everything, tolerate everything. I mean, if people are going to be transgender, transvestites, that's all fine and dandy. I mean, this is the agenda today. Yeah. Christians are accepting things that you never thought they would accept. They're putting up with things that you never thought that they would have put up with. And it's simply because the devil has control of their mind instead of the Lord having control of their mind. Yeah. Right. And it would be solved by spending time in the Bible. Amen. Not hour after hour in front of the hell vision, in front of the tell lie vision. In front of movies that are put out by people who reject the God of the Bible and they prefer Eastern mysticism, Buddhism, Hinduism, these satanic counterfeit religions. Now, a lot of people would say, well, you know, come on, Star Wars is a good, clean movie. It's good, clean fun. And you say, well, what about all the religion, though? What about all the religious overtones of Star Wars? And here's what they'd say. Yeah, but we just ignore that part, right? We ignore that part. But here's my question then. If you're ignoring that part, then why do you believe all hate is bad? Yeah. If you ignore that part, then why do you believe that fear is bad? If you ignore that part, then why do you believe anger is bad? I mean, people will hear a preacher get up and get angry and scream about sin and say, oh, he's angry. That means he's not filled with the Spirit. That's what they say. Anytime a preacher gets up and gets mad at sin and preaches hard, they'll say, that preacher is not filled with the Spirit. I can tell by the anger. Because if he were filled with Spirit, he'd be peaceful and calm. That's what they say. But, but that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that when the Spirit of the Lord came upon Saul, he was filled with anger. That's what it says. Spirit of the Lord came upon Saul and he was filled with anger and he took oxen and chopped them up and mailed them out to everybody and says, this is what I'm going to do with your oxen if you don't get in the Lord's army. Amen. Okay, I mean, I'm just telling you a Bible story tonight. Is that okay? Oh, oh, you want me to tell you about long ago in a galaxy far, far away? Why don't I just tell you about a few thousand years ago in this galaxy, on this planet, in reality, something that actually really happened right. when a man became filled with the Holy Spirit. He became angry yeah. right. at the Lord's enemies. He became angry at oppression. 
you know, uh, that's biblical. Yeah. But yet today, people, oh, peaceful, calm. Yeah, because let the force flow through you, Luke. Yeah. When you're peaceful and calm and passive, yeah. just let go and let the force flow through you. Don't get angry. Don't hate. That's the dark side. So, you know, it doesn't jive. So which one do most Christians in America believe? The Star Wars mentality or the biblical mentality? You already know the answer to that question. But no, we just watch it and it doesn't affect us. Because we know what the Bible teaches. We're not going to get into Eastern mysticism. Funny how you agree with Obi-Wan Kenobi on all these points. If, but it doesn't affect you. Fear. Look at Proverbs 28, 13. The Bible says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Happy is the man that feareth alway. Now, how does that fit in with this whole fear is always wrong mentality? Happy is the man that feareth alway, but he that hardeneth his heart shall fall into mischief. Flip over to Ecclesiastes chapter 12, the next uh, book in the Bible there. While you're turning there, I'll read for you Revelation 14, verse 7, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the, honor, for the hour of His judgment has come, and, the, and worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. So the Bible commands us over and over again to fear God, fear the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, the Bible says. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the fear of the Lord is the beginning of understanding. That's where it starts. That's level one. You're not even to level one. You're a type zero, you know, as Michio Kaga. You know, you haven't even made it to level one until you learn to fear the Lord. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. That's it in a nutshell. Fear God and keep his commandments. Now, many people will try to say, well, Fear doesn't really mean fear in this situation. It just means respect. Well, then let me ask you this. Why is it several times mentioned in the Bible, fear and trembling? You don't just tremble out of respect. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, 5, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in singleness of your heart as unto Christ. Philippians 2, 12, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Psalm 2, verse 11, Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. God says that we are to fear and tremble before Him. Now, the Bible does say, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Here's the thing. As we grow in our walk with the Lord, we move away from fear and toward the love of God. But it begins with fear. Why do we even get saved in the first place? To escape hell. Fear of hell. Fear of the Lord causes men to depart from hell because of the fact that they are scared of that and they put their faith in Jesus Christ as a savior because they first realize that there's a danger to be saved from, right. which is the punishment for their sins. And so our life starts with fear. Now, a child that's born into their family and they start to grow up and they get a little older and they start committing sins and, and doing wrong, they need to be disciplined. The Bible teaches that we must not spare the rod and that we must uh, chasten our son while there is hope and so forth. That child in the beginning is going to obey out of fear because a two-year-old or a three-year-old isn't going to come to grasp the concept of, you know, I just love my parents so much, I don't want to disappoint them. So I'm not going to throw this temper fit right now. I'm actually going to obey and go to bed when I'm told. They don't think, you know, what, what gets them to obey in the beginning is fear. Then as they get older, they grow in love for their parents and they get the character to do what's right and they move more toward love as opposed to fear. But there's nothing wrong with the fear of the Lord. No, the fear of the Lord is only praised. Only praised in the Bible. It's only positive. Fear of anyone or anyone else is always negative in the Bible. If we fear man, if we fear, uh, you know, uh, what man could do. But when we fear the Lord, that's great. So there is a place for fear, isn't there? So can we just say hatred's bad? No, hatred can be bad or it can be good. It depends on what we hate and why. 
Anger, is anger always bad? There are a lot of Christians who think so. They look at a man who's angry and they say, he's not filled with the Spirit. Well, let's see what the Bible says. I already pointed out one scripture to you, but if you would go to Mark chapter 3, verse 5. Mark chapter 3, verse 5, I already pointed out the scripture that, that said, you know, Saul was filled with the Holy Spirit and his anger was kindled as a result. That's not the only story like that. But Jesus Christ himself, and the Bible says of Jesus that the Spirit was not given by measure unto him. I mean, in, in him dwelled all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And the Bible says that he was anointed with the oil of gladness above all his fellows. So he had the ultimate Holy Spirit anointing on his life while he walked and talked on this earth. And why did he have that ultimate Holy Spirit anointing? The Bible says because he loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God anointed him with the oil of gladness above all his fellows. That's why Jesus Christ had such anointing. He was filled with the Holy Spirit 24-7. He walked in the Spirit, in the power of the Holy Spirit. The Bible's clear on that. But look at Mark 3, verse 5 about Jesus. It says, And when he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he saith unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. Did Jesus have a right to be angry here? Absolutely. Was he filled with the Spirit? Was he godly in this anger? What about when he preached in Matthew 23? You can feel the anger in that chapter. Yeah. I mean, he is rebuking and harshly criticizing the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the lawyers. And there's anger there. But it's a righteous anger. It's a godly anger. In fact, there's even a command in Scripture, Ephesians 4.26, that starts out with these words, Be ye angry. Be ye angry and sin not. Now, if anger were a sin, that verse wouldn't make any sense because how could you be angry and sin not if all anger is sinful? Obviously, it's possible to be angry and not sin. Then he explains how. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. So we're not to harbor anger. We're not to hang on to anger and be angry from day to day. There's a time to get angry, but then it's time to put that aside go to bed at night, wake up and start a fresh morning and not to just be a person who dwells on past grievances. The passage is about forgiveness in Ephesians 4. He says we need to forgive others and not be angry with them today about what they did unto us yesterday. But it's not wrong to be angry. And there's a, a verse in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verse 22. If you want to flip back there. Where in the modern versions, they change this verse to make it out that anger is always wrong. Because in this scripture, it says, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. In the modern versions, the NIV, the ESV, scriptures like that, they take out the without a cause. So now it's just, well, if you're angry with your brother, you're in danger of judgment. That would make Jesus a sinner. Because he was angry with his brother. So it's very important, of course, that we have a King James Bible, accurate Bible, not these new modern Bible of the Month Club Bibles that they keep changing all the time. And that kind of seem to fit in with what's popular, this doctrine of, you know, no anger, no, no hatred, no fear. Look, I'm not saying that all three of these things can't be sinful. There are times when all of them are sinful. Fear can be sinful. Anger can be sinful. Hatred can definitely be sinful. But it's not always sinful. It's not some dark side. It's not like, oh, let's only have positive, 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 sweetness and light, and no dark side, nothing negative ever. Which is what these films are teaching, which is the mentality that they portray, which is not unique to them. It comes from Buddhism. Okay? Now, here are some other things about Star Wars from a religious standpoint. First of all, just the fact that Darth Vader is born of a virgin should raise a red flag with you. Yeah, right. That there are some weird religious undertones in this film. Who knew that? Put up your hand if you already knew that. Yeah, I remember I, I, I you know, I saw, this is back when I was going to the movies and stuff, and I watched the um, episode one when it came out back in 1999 or whenever it was. And I walked out of there and I said to somebody, I said, 
that was pretty weird about how they're making Darth Vader be born of a virgin. And the person I said that to said, what are you talking about? I don't remember that in the movie. But it's there in the movie. It's right there in the movie because, you know, the guy asked her, so who's the father? She's like, oh, there was no father. And it was, it was conceived by the force. Okay, which the force is like a replacement for God in this uh, movie series. So flip over, you went to Daniel chapter 11. So Darth Vader is born of a virgin, according to episode one. And also Darth Vader comes to fulfill prophecy. There's a lot of talk about the prophecies and, and things that this guy would come and he's going to bring balance to the force. Okay. And then, of course, eventually Darth Vader sacrifices his life and brings balance to the force. This virgin born Darth Vader. Okay. But when we think of the force, you know, again, this calls to mind Buddhism, Eastern mysticism, Hinduism. And if you think about it, in the movie, there's a lot of meditation that goes on. And I'm not talking about biblical meditation. See, biblical meditation is when we meditate on God's word day and night. That's actually where we memorize scripture and then think about the scripture that we memorize, kind of run through verses in our mind and think about what they mean. That's what meditation is biblically. That's a good meditation to sit and dwell on God's word. But. The meditation that we see in Star Wars is basically like unto Buddhist and Hindu transcendental meditation. And this is a very dangerous practice. And you know, Christians get mixed up in some of this stuff. They get mixed up into yoga. And they say, well, it's just great stretching. But here's the thing, though. Just, you could probably just stretch on your own without yoga. Or you could probably find a different stretching program, not one that came from a Satan-worshipping false religion called Hinduism. You know, I mean, find a different... Pro Plus, I think stretching's overrated anyway. I, ne I don't stretch before I run. Woo! So, you know, some people can overdo stretching anyway. You know, you see these people bending themselves into a pretzel. I'm not sure that's even totally beneficial. Because your muscles are like rubber bands. And if you stretch them too much, it's like a rubber band that's been stretched too much. You know, it doesn't have as much uh, strength. But anyway, that's a fitness discussion that has no place in the house of God. So I'm not going to go into that. So the bottom line is that Christians can sometimes get into these meditative type practices and this type of yoga influence where they're doing these breathing exercises and all this stuff. And a lot of it seems pretty benign on the surface. But when they talk about making your mind blank, this is what you have to be aware of. Because one of the big things about Buddhism is just completely emptying your mind where you're just thinking about nothing and you're kind of in a trance. And, you know, you're in this state of what they call in Hinduism dreamless sleep where you just have no thoughts and your mind is just empty because they teach that when you do that, then enlightenment will come in. And according to these hardcore Buddhists and, and Hindus that go through these processes of, you know, fasting and vegetarianism and meditating and all this stuff, then basically these spirits will come in and commune with them. And we know what that is. That's demonic. Yeah. When you're sitting there and opening yourself up, right? Luke, let, go, let the force flow through you. Just be passive, right? Just kind of sit back and let it come to you and let it come in. This is actually demonic. And a lot of people have demonic experiences through Hindu and Buddhist style meditation. This is not biblical meditation. We're to meditate on God's word, not to just blank out our mind and just, oh, oh, you know, and try to sit there and levitate objects. And le look, this is all straight out of Eastern religion. And it's, it's wicked religion. It's not something that we should be influenced by. This idea of God being an impersonal force. No, man is made in the image of God. God is a he God is a person. God has personality. God is not just this impersonal force in the universe. But look, if you would, at uh, Daniel chapter 11. And I'm going to show you the force in the Bible. 
It says in Daniel 11.36, and just to give you the context, this is a scripture that has to do with the Antichrist. This is prophetic of the Antichrist putting himself above all gods. And it says in verse 36, The king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the god of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any god, for he shall magnify himself above all, but in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. So notice, he's not going to honor a personal God, but he will honor the God of forces. And, and the reason that that's left capitalized there, God of forces, is because it's a name of a God. So you capitalize a proper name there. The God of forces is, according to the Bible, the God of the Antichrist because of the fact that the New Age movement is part and parcel of the Antichrist yep. and his religion. A lot of this stuff comes from the Kabbalah, from Antichrist Judaism, and the God of forces is going to be something that the world accepts, and they're being prepared for it with all of this Eastern mysticism coming into our Western culture through things like Star Wars, the Force, and so forth. This whole, the good and the dark side, think about the symbol of the false Chinese religion, Taoism, the yin and yang, right? And think about how it's that black and that white swoosh thing with the circle, about how there's a little bit of good in that which is evil, and a little bit of evil in that which is good, and how they both work together. You know, it's the force, right? The good side, the dark side. You know, there's still some good invader. You know, it's like there's never too late for anyone, right? That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches absolute good in God. God is light and in him there's no darkness at all. Amen. And the Bible says of Satan, there is no truth in him. He's absolute evil. Amen. Satan is absolute evil. God is absolute good. That yin-yang symbol has no place in Christian theology or with the God of the Bible. But the world has that philosophy. The force teaches that philosophy. Not only that, but you know, the thing that stood out to me as a little five-year-old boy, or however old I was, I was a really small kid, when I saw my first Star Wars movie, Return of the Jedi. You know, the first thing that stood out to me was when Luke Skywalker first comes on in that particular movie, he looks like he's a Catholic priest or something because he has like this collar turned around backward. It's like when he became a Jedi, he gets a backward turned around collar at the beginning of Return of the Jedi. Did anybody ever notice that or is it just me? Am I the a couple people? Yeah. I saw that as a little kid. I was like, whoa, is this dude a Catholic priest? Because I was always taught. And I teach this to my kids. I've taught this in when I used to be a Sunday school teacher back in the day. I always taught that any preacher who has his collar turned around backwards is a false teacher. Always taught that. I, I remember when I was in South Chicago, there were a lot of the Baptist churches there that were not Baptist in doctrine. They were charismatic Pentecostal churches. And they would call themselves missionary Baptist, but they were not Baptist at all. And I remember I would draw a picture in my Sunday school class in South Chicago and hold up a picture of a guy with a collar turned around back and say, this is the bad preacher. Because a lot of these missionary Baptists, false teachers that taught a workspace salvation, that taught you to lose your salvation, would turn their collar around backwards so they could look like a Catholic priest. Hey, I don't want to look anything like a Roman Catholic priest. And that's why I would never turn my collar backwards. I'd rather abstain from all appearance of evil. Amen. But that just seemed a little weird. They're trying to put a religious overtone on this with the virgin birth. Well, you know, Luke gets the backwards collar at the beginning of return. I hope I'm remembering that right. A couple other people said they saw it too. So I think I'm remembering it right. It's been a while. But anyway, uh, these are some of the things in Star Wars. Now, let me say this, this philosophy of a positive only, which is what Star Wars teaches, you know, any negative emotion, any fear, any anger, any hatred is the dark side, has crept into Christianity and we see a positive only movement in the likes of people like Joel Osteen. 
But, you know, another guy that was really well known for this doctrine of positivism and positive only type of thing was a guy by the name of Norman Vincent Peale. Who knows who I'm talking about? This guy, Norman Vincent Peale. All right, it was only the older crowd. You're dating yourselves. No, I'm just kidding. But back in, in the previous generation, you know, this was a big name. Norman Vincent Peale, the power of positive thinking. He was on the bestseller list with his book for a couple of years straight. And he sold millions of copies of this book. Now, this guy was a Protestant pastor, but this guy taught a lot of false doctrine. And guess who grew up going to this guy's church? Power of Positive Thinking Church. His pastor was Norman Vincent Peale. Donald Trump. Yeah. So lately, Donald Trump has been saying how, oh, man, I'm a Christian. I'm Protestant. He said, I'm Presbyterian. And he said, I grew up going to listen to my pastor, Norman Vincent Peale. And he said, oh, I loved, he was the great Norman Vincent Peale. Wonderful man of God. And oh, so great. Now, this doctrine of the power of positive thinking has to do with a lot of just praising yourself and kind of looking at yourself in the mirror and, you know, I'm, I'm a great person. You're going to succeed today. And it was all about sort of using God to gain a lot of success in life. That's how, you know, Trump interprets it too. Is like, oh yeah, you know, it's all about succeeding and, and making money and, and being successful in the world's eyes. And this power of positive thinking is how you're going to basically climb the ladder in the corporate world and succeed and make money and all this worldly achievement that you're going to get through tapping into this energy that is God. Now, what does that sound like? You know, God as the force. God, you know, use the force, Luke. Like, using God for your own gain. Using God, if I can just tap into these secrets of Christianity, then I can make money and be successful. It has, they suppose that gain is godliness, as it says in 1 Timothy 6. From such, withdraw thyself. But I got to tell you this, and, and, and I have to cover this in the sermon tonight. I don't think that there's a more prideful, arrogant person on this planet than Donald Trump. I mean, the guy is like a caricature. He's like a, it's like a parody or something. It's almost like a joke, like it's almost like a comedy or something. How prideful and arrogant this guy is. Where does it come from? It comes from this preaching that only ever builds you up and puffs you up and it's all positive and the power of positive thinking and builds you up and you walk out with an ego as huge as Donald Trump. That's the product of this type of Christianity, this positive only Christianity. Maybe if Norman Vincent Peale would have had a little more anger and got up and ripped some face on sin, maybe Donald Trump would have grown up to be a more godly person. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe if Norman Vincent Peale would have had a little more hatred in his heart for sin and ungodliness and wickedness, he could have done some real preaching that could have influenced young Donald <laughs> to grow up and have a little bit more of a modest, humble view of himself. What does the Bible say about pride? The Bible says in Psalm 10, verse 3, For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire, and blesseth the covetous whom the Lord abhorreth. The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. Recently, Donald Trump was asked, do you ever ask the Lord for forgiveness? Have you ever asked God for forgiveness? He just said, well, you know, I mean, I just, I just do the right thing, and I don't have to ask forgiveness. I mean, I, don't, I can't remember asking forgiveness because, I mean, I just do right. I just do the right things. I mean, it's bizarre to listen to this guy talk. He literally just talks about, man, I'm such an awesome guy. Man, everybody loves me everywhere I go. Man, I'm the richest guy. All the most famous people. I say jump and they say how high on the way up. I, you know, I've controlled all the politicians with my money. I know I, I hang around with all the biggest people. I'm the most successful guy. I'm a cool, I'm a good looking guy. I'm an awesome guy. I mean, it's weird. Has anybody else, is it just me? It's weird. I mean, it's crazy. It's like, what? Now, you expect politicians to praise themselves, right. right? 
You kind of just come to expect that politicians are going to get up and praise themselves and say, look at my wonderful track record. Look at all the wonderful things I've done. My record speaks for itself, and I've done this, and I've done that. And when I get in office, I'm in a clean house. These guys don't know what they're doing, but my businesses have all succeeded, and I'm number one. And I'm You expect that, but he takes it to a whole new level that I've never even seen. I've never seen it. It's like a parody. It's weird that anybody could not just be revolted by listening to this guy talk. What does the Bible say? The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Okay, well, where does that lead us? Does it lead us to the dark side? No, the Bible says that when we hate evil, he says, pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. See, I hate that froward mouth. I hate that pride, that arrogancy. That's what the Bible says we should hate. The Bible said when pride cometh, then cometh shame. But with the lowly is wisdom. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Everyone that is proud is an abomination to the Lord. L let me just back up and say that again. Everyone, this is Proverbs 16, 5. Everyone that is proud is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, and I'm sure he's had hand join in a lot of hands, he shall not be unpunished. Better it is to be of an humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. I bet some of his ex-wives would probably agree with that too. An high look and a proud heart and the plowing of the wicked is sin. Proud and haughty scorner is his name who dealeth in proud wrath. A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. Go to Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter number 4. The Bible says in James chapter 4 verse 6, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. What am I trying to say tonight? I'm telling you, this positive only religion that we see today, this positive only Christianity, this your best life now mentality, this God is not mad at you, Mentality. I mean, there's a book out by Joyce Meyer called God is not mad at you. No matter who you are, no matter what you do. No, the Bible says God is angry with the wicked every day. But see, oh, God's not mad at you. Oh, it's just the power of positive thinking. Just everything's going to go great. They say peace, peace when there is no peace. What is the result of this positive only Christianity that we see? An imbalance where it's all love, no hate. You know, all boldness, no fear. It's just all uh, positive and no negative. The result is people who are proudful and arrogant people. Why? Because nobody's ever telling them that sometimes you're not doing that great. Sometimes you're being an idiot. And somebody needs to rebuke you and tell you that. Sometimes you don't need a pat on the back. Sometimes you need a swift kick in the pants. And people who never get that swift kick in the pants, they grow up to be arrogant, prideful, self-glorifying, boastful people. The Bible says in Daniel chapter 4, verse 28, all this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spake and said, is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the power, by the might of my power? And for the honor of my majesty, is not this the great Trump Tower that I've built? Is not this the great business that I've built? While the word, verse 31, was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O king Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. And they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen and seven times shall pass over thee until thou know that the most high ruleth in the kingdom of man and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Amen. The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar and he was driven from men and did eat grass as oxen and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hairs. Uh oh. Uh oh. Donald Trump. It might, maybe the process has already started. Till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers. And his nails like bird goes. I wonder if that hairdo is the curse of God on Donald Trump. He did it to Nebuchadnezzar. I'm sorry. But you, you say, well, come on, Pastor Anderson. 
Donald Trump's our guy. You know what? No. I don't have a guy. Right. No. My guy is Jesus. Amen. I don't have a guy. You say, well, you're preaching about the election. I'm not even voting in the election, let alone Amen. preaching. I don't even care about the election. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but Donald Trump's our guy. No, because God said that everybody who's proud is an abomination. Yeah, that's right. That, oh, sorry to confuse you with the Bible, but everyone who's proud is an abomination. I'd be shocked if even the most staunch fan of Donald Trump would say, well, he, no, he's very humble. <laughs> I mean, it's just a, it's a joke to even yeah. suggest that, right? But these are the type of people that are produced from a Norman Vincent Peale type Christianity, from a positive only type Christianity. Uh, it's, it's not a pretty sight, literally and figuratively. It's not a pretty sight. You know, when you hear this guy praising himself, and, it, you know, you expect it from politicians, but, I mean, it's just to the point of, of where it's just a joke. I mean, it's unbelievable. You know, maybe you haven't heard this guy talk, and that, you know what, great if you haven't, because it's great to just unplug from any of this. But I just recently... I hadn't, I hadn't been hearing him because I, I don't really pay any attention to these things because I, you know, I kind of know that it's all controlled and everything and I'd rather just, you know, focus on that, which is spiritual. But recently I sat down and just watched this guy talk about Norman Vince Appeal. And I watched that and it was just like in 10 minutes, he praised himself like a hundred times. It was bizarre. It was sick. It made me want to throw up. And I don't like being around people like that, where they just say, look how great I am, you know. And it's just like Nebuchadnezzar. And it's just like so many other people in the Bible who are destroyed by pride. You know, you want to talk about the dark side? It's pride. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's going to take you to the dark side. You know, when you start exalting yourself to where you say, I don't even need to receive forgiveness from God. He said, well, I go to, you know, I go to church. I eat the little cracker. I, I, I drink the little wine, you know. It's, you know, you sound like you're not discerning the Lord's body. You know what I mean? Isn't that, didn't God say something about that in 1 Corinthians 11? Sounds like you're eating and drinking damnation on yourself, buddy. Being blasphemous and making light of the Lord's Supper. <laughs> you know, and just, yeah, you don't need forgiveness. Well, you know what? Don't worry because you're not going to get any. Because, you, you know, what do you need it for, right? You don't make mistakes. At least not big ones. That haircut was a big mistake, or whatever, whatever you call that thing. But anyway, the moral of the story is this. We need to spend more time in God's Word. Man, we've all, and, and here's the thing. Look, I'm guilty because I grew up rotting my brain on the television probably more than most people. I mean, I grew up watching TV all day long, going, watching all the movies, playing video games, and spending little time in God's Word. You know, it was only when I was about 16 or 17 that I actually got serious about reading the Bible we all have picked up wrong philosophies and wrong mentalities from this world and we need the washing of water by the word in our lives. Amen. And you know, for somebody to get angry at this sermon, that's the dark side. No, I'm just kidding. But for, for somebody to get angry, for somebody to get angry at this sermon, I don't know how you could get angry at this sermon because honestly, I'm just telling you, read the Bible and get your, get your beliefs from that. Because we're all being influenced by the prince of the power of the air. You know, we're, we've all seen enough of this stuff. And it's time to shut it off and turn this on. Amen. Is this going to do you wrong? Is this going to give you the wrong doctrine? No, this is going to fix things. And honestly, people would stop thinking that real preaching is so crazy if they'd actually read the Bible. They'd realize... That it's just what the Bible says and they're just not used to it because they're more used to what the world dishes out. So let's get in the word. Let's study to show ourselves approved unto God. Let's meditate on this book. Day. Let's skip the yoga class and meditate on this book day and night. Amen. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for the, the word that you've given us that we can have a spiritual meal every day. We can meditate on your word, Lord. We can be filled with the spirit. We can ingest these truths, Lord. We've all had a lot of junk put into our mind and a lot of ideas that are contrary to Scripture. And Lord, if someone disagrees with me on any of the subjects that I preach tonight, on the subject of hatred, the subject of anger, 
the subject of fear, the subject of pride. Lord, I hope that they disagree with me because they read their whole Bible cover to cover multiple times and decided that what I'm saying is not scriptural and not that they just disagree with me because they were in church their whole life and they've just never heard this before. And that isn't what I think is right. Lord, help us all to use your word as the measuring stick and, and not what the world tells us is right and wrong and not to listen to some green puppet tell us what's right and wrong instead of listening to the eternal word of God. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.